What's good, guys? Today is Friday, July the 8th, 2022. This video is going to be in reference to the Kanika Jenkins case and specifically the interview that Irene Roberts did with Zach TV One roughly a week after um, the incident that happened at the Crown Plaza where Kanika Jenkins was found in the freezer in September of 2017. Today I was doing a little bit of research regarding deception. Um, for those that don't know, my degree is in criminal justice and I try to stay current on anything relating to that field. So I was reading some professional articles regarding deception and deception cues. And I want to explain what even got me here in the first place. Um, I started thinking about, I just can't let go of Irene Roberts, nor can I let go of Pease and Killa's interviews with Zach TV One. And um, I think deception is a very interesting field to get into. Uh, trying to study when someone's lying, um, the verbal and nonverbal specifically cues that people will uh, demonstrate. So, I want to talk a little bit ab about um, the Pinocchio effect. That is actually a real thing. Now, we all know the old story of Pinocchio and how whenever he lies, his nose gets really big. And while it's a funny way to portray lying, there's also quite a bit of truth behind Pinocchio's nose. You see, whenever we lie our nose gets a little itchy. I know, it sounds a bit weird, especially when you hear that our nose contains something called erectile tissue. Yes, the same tissue that forms our sensitive parts. According to neurological director Alan Hirsch, when a person lies, blood flow increases to the erectile tissues in the body, including the erectile tissues in the nose. This is why liars often touch or scratch their nose. So if you're wondering why Pinocchio's lying cue is his nose, it's no coincidence. And do you know who a great example of nose touching is? Former President Bill Clinton. In Clinton's 1998 grand jury testimony in the Monica Lewinsky case, neurologists found that when the former president was truthful, he never touched his nose. However, when Clinton lied, he gave a split-second frown and touched his nose once every four minutes afterward. And here's the most surprising part. Bill Clinton ended up touching his nose a total of 26 times during the testimony. Was he lying? Most undeniably, refutably, 100%, yes. Here's a short clip of Bill Clinton where you can see him rubbing slash scratching his nose as a line cue. Now, I will play this short video. It's like 12 seconds long. But just notice what they're talking about. Does he misled Judge Wright in some way that you would have corrected the record and said, excuse me, Mr. Bennett, uh, I think the judge is getting a misimpression by what you're saying. The article goes on to say, special note, this doesn't mean all people who touch their noses are liars. Sometimes a person might have a runny nose or it might just be cold outside. Context is important and nose touching is just one statistical cue to detect deception. Now, um, another cue is touching the neck. That is also a deception cue. Not every neck touch means someone is lying, but it is one uh, nonverbal cue. When people tell lies, it doesn't only come out verbally. A lie often makes a quick stop in the neck on the way up, making the neck a great hotspot for detection deception. 
If a person touches their neck, it can be an indicator of increased sweat due to nervousness or anxiety from being caught in the act. If a person is wearing a collar, they might tug at it or adjust it instead to seem less obvious. The Pisa site researcher Desmond Morris as the first person to discover that lying causes a tingling sensation in the facial and neck tissues. People usually scratch their neck to get rid of this tingling. The Pisas also conducted their own observations. Here's what they found. When people lie, they scratch their necks on average five times each time they scratch, rarely more and rarely less. Quite interesting. Another nonverbal cue, ears. Um, I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember Carol Burnett. Uh, she always tugged at her ears. Ears aren't just for listening. Many people might not know that they are a great indicator of lying too. Specifically, pulling or touching the ears is a subconscious way to stop hearing the lies a person is telling. In more obvious cases, if a person who rarely lies feels embarrassed or really nervous, their ears might flush a bit red and rise in temperature due to the increased blood flow. The Pisas mention these other variations of ear touching, rubbing the back of the ear, tugging the earlobe, putting the fingertip inside the earlobe, and bending the entire ear to cover the ear hole. Um, another nonverbal is a microexpression. When people tell lies, they are usually sad, angry, or fearful. They want to hide from the truth. This is a quote from Will Smith. Human beings are not creatures of logic. We are creatures of emotion. And we do not care what's true. We care how it feels. And that's, um, that's a pretty true statement. We are all about emotion. We don't want to tell the truth. We tell a lie instead. We feel bad about lying. Now, somewhere in that equation, we tend to give away little facial cues to signal that we're lying. And most well-seasoned liars know this. They know that when we lie, we tend to give off multiple little negative signals that expose ourselves. That's why they learn to suppress their emotions. Liars might even look unnatural in the act, like their face is displaying an unnatural blank stare look. That's important. Blank stare. And here are a few um, of these micro expressions. Upper eyelid raised. Wrinkles in the forehead that are in the center. Eyebrows are raised and drawn together. Mouth is open. Eyes have the upper white showing. Now, the neurologist Alan Hirsch also believed that body language is a reliable indicator of lying. A liar will lean forward, rest elbows on a table, constantly change posture or position, and or increases touching or rubbing of the face, ears, hair, or nose. He argues that when a person lies, blood flow increases to the erectile tissues in the body, including the erectile tissues in the nose. The nose engorges which causes a liar to touch or scratch his or her nose. It is truly the Pinocchio effect. I went on to another article that was on the American Bar Association, and I just want to give you just a little bit of background before I fully get into the Irene Roberts interview. Educate you, and then we're going to apply it to Irene Roberts. Now, the American Bar Association's article said, We all encounter deceptions and half-truths in ordinary life. And body language can help us better identify when people aren't being honest, says litigation attorney Christopher Myers of Willichick and Bartness, noting research that shows up to 90% of human communication is nonverbal. Over the past decade, Myers has mastered an understanding of the nonverbal cues that people unconsciously reveal about their true thoughts and feelings, and offers many of those lessons learned in a recently published podcast for the American Bar Association Section of Litigation's Sound Advice Series. In examining a witness's nonverbal communication, he says that many of the indicators that help determine when a person is lying come from a person's face. We all know that a person's eyes tell us a lot. The classic sign most people think about 
are when people refuse to make eye contact or they look away from you. But Myers cautions that compulsive liars are aware of this sign, the uh, not being able to hold the eye contact or looking away, and they will hold your gaze for far too long to make you want to believe them. Since a person's eyes alone won't tell you the whole story, look for multiple clues, such as some of the lesser known ones provided by a liar's nose. When a person lies, chemicals are released in the body that cause the blood vessels in the nose to swell. So the nose will physically expand during deception. Look for nose touches. When a liar's nose swells, a histamine is released, causing itching. This um, attorney also referenced President Bill Clinton. Said he was a good yet extreme example of this. And also cited the green jury testimony. Neurologists who have studied the video of Clinton's 1998 grand jury testimony in the Monica Lewinsky case found that when the former president was truthful, he never touched his nose. But when he lied, he gave a split-second frown and touched his nose every four minutes afterwards. A person's smile may tell you a lot, too. Meyer said that a tight-lipped smile can indicate that an individual is perhaps holding a secret or at least holding something back. If you are examining a witness that is indicating this behavior, you should explore the situation further. Facial gestures are among other clues of deceit. Take note of neck scratching and unusual head movements. Liars will use their heads in odd ways, Meyer says. For example, they may try to sell you their lie by shaking their head excessively when they speak. So, Obviously, when I'm thinking about deception, I go right back to the Kanika Jenkins case. And I can't forget about these interviews that Zach TV One did. Number one, because I think that, um, and I'm going to just specifically speak about Irene Roberts. While she was uncomfortable and nervous during the interview, I also think that she was less nervous um, and anxious because it was Zach TV one and not the police. Uh, in other words, she's speaking to a peer. So she was less nervous than she would be if she was sitting there talking with a detective. Now, I went back and watched this multiple times. And for those that don't know, it's roughly an hour long. So I've spent time last night and most of the day today checking out this uh, interview and I want to show you what I found. The first touch to the face was when she was talking about the party started getting lit around 2 a.m. And that's what this is from. 
the second was when Zach TV one confirmed that she was from the west side of Chicago. Now, let me preface this. I should have done this before I even talked about it. I'm not saying that every single nose touch is deception. But it's a lot. It is a lot of nose touching in this interview. Moving on. The next nose touch. The girls were all together in Kanika's mother's car shortly after 2 a.m. That's when she touched the nose. Zach asked her in this one, the video of the girls in the washroom, was that at the party? And she confirmed yes. Posting the live on Monifa's Facebook page and tagging herself to let people know the party was bussing. Um, Zach TV one said it's sort of like a marketing strategy. She agreed, touched her nose. All he said here was, I have to ask you this and no disrespect. And immediately the hand went to the nose. Zach TV started talking about the two guys in front of her in the reflection of her sunglasses and how people were saying that was this person or this person. And she said that, no, it was two dudes in front of her and K uh, Kanika Jenkins and Monifa Shelton were all the way over there having a whole other conversation. She touched her nose again when she was talking about Kanika was on the stool. Monifa was on the bed talking about she's not enjoying herself. Kanika says, I am enjoying myself. They were saying, you're drunk. And she says, I'm not even drunk yet. And Irene says, yes, uh, Kanika, you're drunk when you say that. That means you're drunk. She touched her face when, or nose rather, when he asked her if her birthday was on Friday. And Irene says it was three days after that, that was her birthday. Or it was three days after her birthday. That's when the party was. So she had turned 21 three days previous to the party. Now Zach starts talking about um, bopping and how Kanika was leaned back on the wall and he asked Irene if she was stumbling. And Irene said, no, we were all still bopping and dancing. Nose touch. He then asked her, what made Kanika leave that room on the 9th? The next time she touched her nose was when he said, when, when it was said that the party was still lit when Kanika went missing. Everybody was high or drunk. Zach asked her, when did y'all go tell the staff, uh, the hotel staff, that Kanika was missing? Irene says, the Bluetooth speaker died and the party basically died too. This was like maybe 30 minutes to an hour later. Yeah, this was like three o'clock. No stitch. When did you get the call that Kanika was still not found? Irene says, I think I went home, went to my cousin's house. And that's when she called uh, Lenore, Kanika's sister, and inquired about Kanika. Were the guys who were in the room when you left supposed to lock the door, keep the key, or you didn't care like I already paid, etc.? Irene says, party's over with. It's my party and somebody else's party, and he got his own key. So I did my part, is what Zach was saying. So basically, she had done her part. And she said, yeah, it's over with. Okay, you leave. But they're still there looking. Nose touch. Um, 
Zach asked Irene what her thought process was on the way to the hotel to look for Kanika with her family. And Irene said she had the feeling something was wrong, something was fishy, because usually Kanika would have called somebody by now. Zach then asked her if she had seen Kanika this drunk before. And Irene tells him that she was like this on her birthday. She touched her nose when the discussion of pills came up. And she told Zach that Kanika didn't do pills. It was just liquor that night. She touched her ear when Zach asked her if she thought somebody had slipped Kanika something. And Irene said, no, these are people we were with all the time. And then touched her ear. You can see it better there. It looks like she actually sticks her finger in her ear. The next time is a nose touch and she's talking about Lenore, uh, her and Lenore being up on the ninth floor, uh, knocking on doors. And she said Lenore gets the call to go downstairs and the police were there saying that they were disturbing people. Next nose touch was when she was talking about peas getting rowdy with the hotel staff and then her waking up and realizing what was going on what had happened basically from the night before because remember she admitted that she was on ecstasy that night she touched her face when she was speaking about the Rosemont Police Department basically profiling her and asking her Hey, don't we know you? Haven't you been arrested before? She touched her nose again when Zach asked her if she saw the freezer for herself. And she said no. She touched her nose again when she made the statement that if Kanika could see good enough to press the L for lobby on the elevator door, then she could have pressed nine to go back up. She touched her nose again when Zach asked her, was there more Facebook live uh, videos from that night that didn't, that you didn't put out? She touched her nose. She said, yes. She actually said, it, it, the conversation verbatim were, was, was there more Facebook Live videos from that night? She interjected and said, yeah. And then Zach carried on and said, that you didn't put out. So she basically answered before he could get the question fully out. Now, there's a lot of reasons why people deceive, uh, lie, these are just a few. Protect someone else from punishment. Maintain privacy. Protect oneself from physical harm. Obtain a reward. Avoid punishment. Exercise power over others. Get out of awkward situations. Win admiration from others. And avoid embarrassment. Well, I'm not saying that everything that Irene said was deceitful. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that it's awfully coincidental that she touched her face a total of 35 times in an hour, roughly hour, interview with Zach TV one Not only did she touch her face, but she basically sat there expressionless. She really made no expression with her face whatsoever. Um... She had a very, what uh, psychologists call flat effect. She had a very flat effect to her face. And I found that odd. And that's, 
that was the main reason I could never let Irene's interview go is because of her expression on her face. Um, but regardless, um, like I said, I'm not saying the whole thing is deceitful, but there's some, there's something to that. There's something to it. Um, she wasn't cold. Um, she had on a tank top. Uh, if she was cold, she would have had something else on. Um, you know, we don't know if what she's telling is true. But I know this, that facial touching is backed by science. And if Irene touched her face 35 times, that's a lot of face touching. Um, I guess I'm going to end the video on that note, but there are some more deception cues that I'm going to be looking into, and I may even come back to this interview, um, but I think it's interesting, very interesting to watch these three interviews specifically and, and watch for these things. So I'm going to end the video on that note, but thanks for watching, guys. I appreciate all of the love and support. Have a great day.